History of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The franchise began as a series of comic books. Uh, the original concept was developed in 1984, the year I was born, uh, by two struggling artists by the names of Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. Uh, while brainstorming, Kevin drew an image of a turtle with a nunchuck, which the two of them thought was absolutely hilarious, because the idea of a turtle, something as lethargic and ponderous as a turtle, having the lightning and killer reflexes of a ninja was ridiculous. And they, they liked it so much they decided they had to make a comic about it. And you know, the next step was to develop a rival for the turtle. And while one of them was in the kitchen, I want to say it was Peter for the sake of balance, but it was probably Kevin again, came up with the idea, he was looking at a cheese grater, and, and said to, to Peter or Kevin, whoever was in, that you know who would make a really good bad guy? A guy with these things on his arms, these cheese graters. We'll call him the grater. And thankfully that idea was developed a little more solidly into the shredder. But that's how it started. And thinking of these concepts and the, the, this brainstorming process they went through. You know, I am a, I'm a big fan of this series. And I like the, the product that ultimately came out of it. But looking back at this story... I'm thinking there was probably some mind-altering agents involved. Because, you know, I get the joke. I just don't think it's that hilarious. A, a Ninja Turtle, like, oh my god, that's impossible. It's fucking awesome. We have to do this. I, I don't feel that way about it. But I, I am glad they came up with the idea and glad that they made the product. But the jokes kept going from there. The studio's name itself was a joke. Mirage Studios. The deal is... They called it that because there was no studio. It was just these two guys and a printer. And they printed out, when they made their first copy of this comic, they printed a thousand copies out of the printer, took it to a local game convention, and then sold it at the game convention. That was how it started. There wasn't some big studio that was in touch with multiple distributors all over the world. It was just two guys with their comic selling it to whoever would pick it up. And, you know, it's, it's part of the process. And the jokes kept going. The name of the franchise itself, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I mean, when you look at the name and you read it, it's ridiculous. Why is it so friggin' long and stupid? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that is stupid. But it's part of the joke. You know, I already explained the Ninja Turtle part, another part of the ninjas, really. Ninjas were very popular at the time as well, and they were in New York, which, again, they thought was ridiculous. Why are there so many ninjas in fucking New York? So that was, again, part of the story, part of the comics. We're going to go over the top with it. We're going to make lots of ninjas, and they've been in New York forever. And the teenage mutant parts were part of the joke as well, the parody. They were parodying the comics that were popular at the time. The big one was Marvel's X-Men and its various spin-offs. So... And that's what Marvel's X-Men were, teenage mutants. Teenagers meant that they dealt with all the regular teenager stories, angst, coming of age, puberty, all that. And along with that, the, the mutant tied into it because it was all about intolerance and discrimination and also tied into the puberty thing as they were getting their powers, as their bodies were changing. So, it all, you know... That, that's how Marvel did their comics, and they were parodying that. They were making fun of it, and it was part of the joke, and it keeps going from there. The tone of the original stories was very dark, very serious, gritty, and it was also graphically violent. And the style that they were parodying there is Frank Miller. If you've experienced Frank Miller's more modern stories, like a lot of the Batman animated features have been based off his work now, like Year One, and... Return of the Dark Knight, as well as Nolan's trilogy of Batman films, the Dark Knight trilogy, were all based off Frank Miller's work. So if you you do some Batman and you read these comics, you see that the styles are very similar. And um, so they were they were parodying everything, everything that was popular, and it was a big joke. And it wound up becoming this huge franchise, just gigantic, and made the millionaires, both of them became millionaires off his franchise. And um, and it was a joke. That's how it started. A cheesy, all but entertaining joke. As far as the original comics go, it should be noted that they were originally produced in black and white and looked like this. Um, 
again because they were they didn't have money to do color and they kept it black and white for a long time. The original comics have been reprinted a few times um, by different companies, currently being reprinted by IDW, who's releasing giant collections for pretty steep prices. But um, with the original black and white comics in it, there is an option, though. The original collections were done way back in the day that uh, the comics were collected into these four graphic novels, like this one here. And when these reprints were done, these collections... They actually colorized it and just, you know, added color to what was there. So, if you want to see these original comics in color, you can hunt down these original graphic novels. They cost a bit of money, but generally they're going to cost less than the collections will. Um, again, if you want it in color... A lot of people are going to tell you you have to do it black and white. You're, you're missing all the art if you get it in color. It's all washed out. Personally, I don't think that's the case. Um, it's, it's a matter of preference. You know, there are details that you're going to kind of miss out on when it's colored. But the problem I have with black and white, let me come up with a good page I can show you here, is for certain sequences, and this is why I'm not a huge fan of manga either, uh and the art style in general when you're looking at a lot of this stuff here's a good one you can't really tell what's going on it's it's a big angry jumbled mess and without with color it's easier to figure out what's what without the color it's hard to tell what you're looking at half the time at least that's my opinion of it and i do feel a lot of times without color you're missing details because the color helps highlight certain things things that otherwise are going to blend right into the background and right into the environments because it looks exactly the same as everything else. It's just a bunch of angry scratches. So if you want, you could hunt down the copies, these graphic novels that are the colored reprints of the original comics. Only There's only four of them that were done. They haven't been done. They never picked back up on it. They never bothered coloring in the other issues. So that is the end of the color. If you don't like the color... These are the only ones you can collect. Uh, as far as the quality of the work itself, um, again, it all depends on your opinion. You partly have to get the joke, and you have to like the joke. You know, it has to appeal to your sense of humor, that cheesy, pun-like joke where it's parodying things, but it's also kind of serious. And, uh, you know, that's, that's half the struggle. The other half is... It's all very action-oriented. Like I said, there's the graphic violence. There's, there are ninjas, so there's ninja action. And... As long as you like that stuff, you're going to like the comics. But it's not real heavy on plot or character development and uh, characterization. And some people, they're going to say it is, but I disagree. I've read a lot of comics, a lot of great comics, and a lot of crappy ones. And I wouldn't count these as crappy comics. They're good. But I wouldn't count them at their... I wouldn't count one of their qualities, their good qualities as being the story. I don't think it is. The artwork, yeah, if you like that, that style, that edgy look... Um, the action, definitely. The sense of humor, yeah. But the story, the plot, I don't think so. The plot's kind of all over the place. And from what I understand, this was actually a case of differing styles between the two artists responsible for it, Kevin and Peter. Uh, from what I understand, and I do believe it's true, uh, I've heard this, but I'm basing it off my own experiences with work that they've contributed to and the comics they've made that I have read, in that Kevin was more focused on the, the comical parts and the action. You know, for him, that's the core of what it was about. And he liked to do stories that was featured those aspects. Peter was more interested in the science fiction time travel. He would take the turtles to other planets, to other dimensions, and put them in these crazy, wild environments that were totally imagined and came from nothing. And it's, it's very imaginative and it's original, it's unique. But the problem I have with those types of stories is you take the turtles out of their environment, they're not in the sewers, they're not in New York, they're not fighting the Foot Clan or Shredder. It's not really a Ninja Turtle story anymore. Now it's random aliens doing crazy things. And turtles just happen to be there. And, you know, I don't care about Professor Honeycutt and his robot. I don't care about the struggle between the Federation and the Triceratons. And 
I don't care about, you know, what was happening in feudal Japan in this alternate reality where there's samurai rabbits and shit. I don't care about that. I want to see the turtles, and I want to see the turtles fight the Foot Clan. That was always, to me, when the turtles were at their best, is when they're fighting Shredder. And when you take Shredder out of it, you lose that part of it that, to me, makes it interesting and just, just fun to watch. I just like watching turtles fight Foot Clan. That's, that's, that's all I want. And that's the same with the comics, which is why I'm pretty selective when it comes to the comics. I have only have, like, this bunch, batch I'm holding right in front of you here. These are all the Ninja Turtle comics I own. Uh, reason being that you know, I was selective. I picked the ones I knew I'd like because it featured the Shredder and the Turtles and the Foot Clan, and I basically ignored the rest. And to this day, I don't have any plans on continuing this comic collection for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, that's the gist of it. And when it comes to the comics, that's what it's going to hinge on for you. Now, the comics are the one property for Ninja Turtles that never really stopped. Whereas, you know, they've had three different cartoons now, um, about five feature films, um, and a handful of video games. But the comics really always were there. Uh, Mirage themselves, especially headed by Peter Laird over the years, would continue to produce Ninja Turtles comics for a very long time. Uh, there was four volumes of them made. Um... There was one volume, volume 3, done by another company called Image, which was retconned by Peter in subsequent releases. So that's a self-contained series. There's also the Archie comics, Adventures of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Those were based on originally on the cartoon and eventually spun into their own continuity. Some people prefer those Archie comics over the ones by Image or Mirage. Um... And there's newer comics, too. When uh, Dreamwave took over the licensing in the early 2000s, they started their own comic in 2003 based off the newer cartoon that was airing on Cartoon Network. but um, Or not Cartoon Network, but Fox. Fox Box. Uh, but it only lasted a few months because the company went under. Uh, IDW eventually purchased all the rights that Dreamwave had, including G.I. Joe, Transformers, and Ninja Turtles. And... Um, they started a whole new series in 2011 for Ninja Turtles, which is unique in itself. And this new series is actually produced, uh, it's written by Kevin Eastman, and uh, I think a guy named Tom something. But Kevin's in charge of the new one. Peter still holds the rights with Mirage, and he has permission to print up to about 18 comics a year, but he actually hasn't made any since, from what I understand, around the time the 2007 movie came out. Uh... From what I understand, and again, we're going from secondhand reports here, is that years ago there was a falling out between Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird over the treatment of the property. Uh, Peter was very protective of the original comics that he and Kevin had done and the original story and um, didn't like what the cartoon series had done with it and a lot of the newer comics had done. He wanted to preserve the story that he and Kevin wrote. And I can understand that. He liked this story. He liked what he and Kevin came up with. and It's a good story. But the problem I have, and, and it may sound like I'm being judgmental for Peter with this, but I have followed him for a long time. I've read a lot of his feedback he gives on new comics, on new shows and movies. And he says the same thing a lot, which is, well, it's not as good as what Kevin and I did. Or it's not like what Kevin and I did, so it's not as good. It just keeps sounding like this. And, it, you know, he phrases it differently, peppers different vocabulary in there, but it always comes out sounding like that. And to me, it sounds egotistical, and it also sounds like no one's ever going to do it right because me and Kevin did it the only right way. And on top of that, it sounds like hes he almost feels as if the new work invalidates what he did. And this is what gets me with a lot of comic book, a lot of writers anywhere who, you know, throw a hissy fit whenever someone changes something about their story in an adaptation or, a, you know, a new story based on it. They, uh, they flip out when it's different, but... Just because there's new Ninja Turtles comics doesn't mean people can't go back and read the comics that you made with your fucking name on it. It isn't invalidated. It's still there. People can still read it. They can still enjoy it. You can even still write your own stories based on it. So why are you telling everybody else that they're doing it wrong because they're not doing it just like you when you're still doing what you do and people can still go back and read what you did? You know, if you like the books better than the movie, you can go read the book. Okay? You can. It's, no one's telling you you're not allowed to go back and read it. You're not allowed to purchase reprints because there's something new out. 
no one's ever telling you that. So it's it baffles my mind that writers won't let other people put their own twist on things. You know, I mean, if it if they change it and it sucks, then yeah, that happens. But your version is still there, and you have the you know satisfaction of knowing that yours is the better version. So who cares? You know, let people compare and contrast and decide which is better. Let them do their own thing, and let let the people reading decide whether or not they think yours is better. You know, what, I don't know why they think they have to go around telling everybody that this isn't as good because I didn't do it yet. I don't know. That's that's just my take on it, and I, I don't get what all the the frustration is about it. You know, like I prefer it in color. Some people say you could only should be able to read it in black and white, but I already told you why I like color, so. If I want to read it in color, I'm going to read it in color. No one's saying you can't get it in black and white. I just wish I could get it in color. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, that's mostly my opinion. And like I said, I don't like, I don't want to be hard on Peter. Uh, I understand he's protective and I don't blame him. But uh, I think he's become closed-minded about it. And he's forgotten that it was a joke to start with. You know, it was a big, cheesy joke. And... Why so serious about it? You know, it's... Why? And I think that was from what I understand. And again, we're going from second-hand sources here. I, I don't have any direct quotes for you. But supposedly that was why Kevin and Peter had a falling out. Because Kevin felt Peter was too close-minded about it. And about, you know, newer interpretations of the characters and sticking to the, to the old script. And Kevin didn't like being restrained in that way. From what I understand. And I can believe it based on the writing habits I've seen from both of these guys. You have the benefit now. You can collect the Mirage comics that Peter's been in charge of to see Peter's style. You can collect the new ones from IDW to see Kevin's. They've also been involved in the recent animated shows. If you want to see, you know, a cartoon with Peter Laird's consent and his involvement, you watch the, the Fox Kids from 2003 cartoon. If you want to see Kevin Eastman's take, you watch the new one that started last, you know, a couple of years ago on Nickelodeon, and that's Kevin Eastman's interpretation. So it's nice that you can compare and contrast it. It's nice to have options. I like it. I like Peter still making them. I like Kevin still making them. I like that other people come in and do their own thing. It's more turtles. Who cares? So whether or not it's worth investing in the comics, um... It's really up to you. Like I said, it doesn't hurt to experiment, to try this, to try that, and see what you like. Uh, also, like I said, the they are involved in the cartoons as well. Um, the original film in particular was adapted directly from the original comics, as was the 2003 series that was on Fox Kids. So that's why I don't try to collect too many of these older comics, because the stories have been retold in better formats to me. Uh, of course, even an animated series and obviously a movie has restrictions that comics don't. So comics can go places and do things they can't. But I still just prefer color and I prefer motion and I prefer sound and voices and music over black and white sketches any day. And while there is more content with the comics... There's also crazier comment. It's a little more out there, it's a little more bizarre, and I don't think that's the strong point of the series, is the content. I think it's the action and the comedy, the sense of humor. And for me, that's what draws me in, and I can get all of that from the, the shows and the movies. I don't get as much from the comics, really. So anyway, that's the history of the comic books. Whether you want to invest in them or not is up to you. Um... But that's how this started, that's how the series started. Next up, we'll talk about the first cartoon series, and we'll go from there. See you next time.